Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can leverage a feature that is sort of hidden in the HTTP client that many people are not using but really should. It's sort of a secret feature and Microsoft is using it internally for many, many things. We're going to see one of them in this video, but I'm also going to show you how you can use it to really do some fantastic stuff with it and there's really no limit with what you can do with this feature. If you like that content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on DomeTrain.com. Now, quick announcement before I move on, we have a brand new course on DomeTrain called Getting Started with Domain Driven Design. That has been one of the most requested topics for courses on DomeTrain and is finally here and is authored by the excellent educator and content creator Amikai Mantinband. And in case you don't know, Amikai has his own YouTube channel, link in the description, give him a sub, but he's also a software engineer in Microsoft whose code powers technologies behind things like Microsoft Office, so literally hundreds of millions of users a month use the stuff he writes. He's an expert on the topic and he actually runs training like that in Microsoft as well, so you're getting the highest quality possible, which is what I wanted to offer with Dome Train in the first place. Now to celebrate the launch, I'd like to offer the first 500 of you a 20% discount code on the course, so use code DDD20 at checkout to claim it, and trust me when I say these do go quick, so if you want to buy it, buy it now. Also, if you buy this Getting Started DDD course, you will also get a special discount code when the deep dive and advanced versions of this DDD course are around, so you can double dip in discounts. All right, enough with that, back to the video. So let me show you what I have here. I have a simple .NET 8 API over here, and it's sort of a weather API, but it's calling a real weather service. I'm using the Open Weather Map API, which is a free, sort of a free tier um, real weather API you can use to grab the weather. So what I can do here, if I just quickly run this, just to show you what's going on, is I can go into Postman, and I can say, give me the weather, for example, for London right now and I can say send and I'm going to get the current weather for London and if I say something like Milan then I'm going to get Milan's weather and so on and so forth. The way this works is I'm registering this open weather service over here which is using an HTTP client factory to create clients over here using the name client feature which we've seen in this channel before and then I'm calling the API over here with this get method of the client and then getting the status code and then passing the weather and returning it and that is basically it. Now, what I want to do is I want to add a layer of caching in here because when you're getting the weather, especially in a service like this where we're paying per request, how much can the weather change in a minute? In London, a lot, but in most places, it doesn't really change that often. So what you can do is you can add caching, for example, and that's just one example of the use cases. You have many, many use cases for what I'm going to show you, but that's just one of them. Now, you can decide to add them on the response cache, the output cache, you can decorate the service, but one of the things you can do is actually add it on the client itself because the HTTP client, this fella over here that eventually will make that API call to the API actually has a bit of an internal pipeline for how the request is handled. So when I say get async, what is going to happen behind the scenes? And in fact, we can actually sit by stepping into the code over here and then into this and then into this and then into Jesus Christ, there's many layers over here. And eventually the send async is you're going to see that the request isn't really sent by the HTTP client itself, but instead through an HTTP message invoker. So that's really what's causing the request to be fired. And actually this is all happening through what is called a handler, which is stored here as an HTTP message handler. Now, there's a default one that will fire those requests, but you actually have control over the pipeline. So you can say before you eventually reach that final handler that will make the real request to an API, I want to do some things with that request. I might want to grab the request, grab the details. I might want to completely sidetrack it. I might say, write my own custom response, or I might say, send it somewhere else. You have full control through this pipeline. But the way we're going to call this, because that's really the name used here, is a delegating handler. So let me just quickly show you what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and create a new class, and I'm going to call that weather handler. So this will be responsible for handling the caching logic of my uh, HTTP handlers for my requests. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and extend the delegating handler. And as you can see, I'm not forced to override anything, but you can say override and you have the send ascend async methods, the synchronous and asynchronous version effectively to send that request to the next thing in the pipeline. So here what I have, and if I just quickly break it down so it's easier to see uh, and add an example here so the gray goes away, is 
I have the send async method, which if you remember, is the thing that eventually will be called to send that request to the real API. But really what's going to happen here is I have a bit of a pipeline where we're starting with nothing and then we can say, go into the cached weather handler first. If you find the weather be cached, then just return the weather. Otherwise, continue in the pipeline and go ahead and make the real request. To do all that, I'm going to go ahead and add an in-memory cache here. So I'm going to say services dot add in memory cache. Here we go. And that allows me to inject the private read only I memory cache interface. And that I can inject from the constructor like this, and I can use it. So the way this would work is basically like a filter in ASP.NET Core or a middleware in ASP.NET Core. So since I have access to the request itself, I can say, grab the query string because I need to find a way to distinguish where this request is going to and say request.requestURI.query. And I want to pass that. So I'm going to say HTTP utility over here and then pass query string. And I'm going to pass that query string over here. Then because I want to cache each request differently for each city and each things like, am I getting Celsius? Am I getting Fahrenheit? I can say, give me the query from the query string and give me the units from the query string and then build a key. So I'm going to build a cache key out of the query and the units. Then what I want to say is try to see if I have something in the cache. So I'm going to say cache.get and I'm going to store that as a string and I'm going to use the key to see if it exists. If cached is not null. So if I actually have something in the cache, then let's go ahead and create a new HTTP uh, message response. And to do that over here, I'm going to turn this into an async method. So HTTP response message, I'm going to say that the request is okay, because that's what under normal circumstances, this API would return. And I'm going to go ahead and say that the content is the string content. And, and I'm going to pass down the cached string as the content. Now, if you actually needed things like the header or the version or the uh, reason phrase or any of the other parameters, you can actually set them here as well. In my case, in this example, I don't need them. So this is enough to create a fake response as if the HTTP client went ahead and it made a real request, but it didn't. And then for the remaining of the behavior, I want to say var response equals await. So go and send that request to the real API and then give me the content. So that will be response.content.read as string async, which means I can pass a cancellation token, but I have to also say uh, await over here. And then I can say cache.set. So I'm going to set that value into the cache. I'm going to say key is here. And then the content is the string. I'm going to say time span from minutes. So cache that for a minute. Let's go ahead and do that and then return response. Now this will make a lot more sense as the whole process flows. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a breakpoint here, a breakpoint here, and then I'm going to register my handler because I need to. So services.add scoped in this case, cached weather handler. And before I run it, looking at this, actually, this should be response, not request. And I should be able to go ahead and run this. So what I want to hit first is actually the open weather map service. So let's go ahead and call that. And as you can see, we hit the breakpoint. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to get a client. And I want to show you in these clients because you can actually see all the handlers. So if I go into the handler section over here, you can see lifetime tracking HTTP message handler, the top level handler. Then we go one level deeper, which is the logging scope handler. And these are all ASP.NET Core and .NET specific handlers that they add out of the box for us. Then in in that, you can find another inner handler, and that is our handler, the cast weather handler. And then our handler has another one, the logging one. And then that handler has the real HTTP client handler. And then that one has the eventual one, which is the socket HTTP handler, the thing that eventually fires the request through the socket. And that is it. So now if we just step over everything, we're going to get the cache key. Obviously, there's nothing in the cache. So we're going to go and make the real call. We're going to put it in the cache. As you can see, the content is here. And then I'm just going to say fire it off. And then the next time we come in here, what is going to happen is, as you'd expect, we're going to go to fire that request. But because we're going to have it in the cache, as you can see, the thing exists, we're going to return it through the cache. And we're not going to make a real HTTP call. Nothing about our application knows about this other than the handler itself. So we add behavior without actually changing 
anything else other than the registration of the client. It is a lovely feature to use for things like this, where you want to have some minor caching logic in there, or maybe you have a header you want to delegate. So let's say you get a request from somewhere that has a correlation ID or an X correlation ID on the header, and you want to pass that down to any subsequent request. Something like this can do it because you can mutate the request as it's coming in. Um, and other things you can do, obviously Microsoft is using it for logging and to track metrics and performance as well. I've personally used it in the past for something like this, where we don't actually go into the real service, but we go to a cache. Now, in that use case, admittedly, I used Redis because my application was distributed, but something like in-memory lends itself very nicely to showcase the feature. But now I wanna know from you, did you know about this and have you used it in the past? What's the craziest use case you have or you can think of for this feature? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching and as always, keep coding.